At 8.43 this morning, though, Ronan Mullen is with us, uh, jet-lagged, and um, I hope you brought some of the nice little chocolates back from, from America. I don't like American chocolate. I don't know what I'm talking about. Ronan, how are you? All good, Chair. All H- good. How was it? Yeah, I didn't really need the, the plane home. I probably could have sailed home on the um, adrenaline of Saturday night. It was unbelievable, and like we would have spoke in the preceding days, and the hype around it... Like, it's ironic, I think there was a tweet put up uh, marking the anniversary of Mayweather versus Pacquiao, which obviously had this crazy build-up and the fight was quite dull in the end, whereas somehow the Taylor Serrano fight superseded that which went before. It was just an incredible spectacle in the ring, out of the ring, and what it's done for boxing at large, I don't think can be overstated. It was just a a huge moment. So, uh, in Madison Square Garden, When does the evening begin to take on that kind of sense of this is something unique and special and and, uh, weirdly, as you said, actually beyond what we thought it could be? Yeah, well, like there's a slightly different culture in America in terms of ticket sales. So in this part of the world, if something's going to sell out, it would have have sold out well in advance. Whereas even with the Canelo fight this weekend, and he's probably the biggest star in boxing, there's a bit of a walk-up element to it where it's going to sell out, but people leave it till the last minute. So we were told sort of midweek that it's tracking towards a sellout. And, you know, you have to take that with a pinch of salt because that it's in the promoter's best interest to, to make that suggestion. But ultimately, you just saw the crowd building on the night and there was a huge Puerto Rican contingent, huge Irish contingent, and then the number rolled in. It was in excess of 19,000. And you're just thinking, sometimes you're desensitised to the Katie Taylor phenomenon because it is that, it's a phenomenon and what she's done, you know, in boxing on a worldwide scale and like on a secondary level to Irish boxing principally. But then you're walking around Times Square in the lead up to the fight and you see like her fight poster emblazoned up there and then it's like I was at a Katie Taylor fight in Madison Square Garden before but she was supporting Anthony Joshua and you know, it was a slightly different dynamic, whereas this was all on the strength of this phenomenal fight. And it wasn't, it's not the kind of, I don't think it's an event that would have sold out if it was any sort of fight. This was like a top tier event um, from an athletic point of view. And you've got two of the top three fighters in the world going head to head. And you just so rarely get that in any, in any sport, really. So all that flux and those mesh of factors served up this unbelievable intrigue before the first bell and then from the first bell it just took on a life of its own and I think it'll be remembered like Boxing News magazine which has been around forever have uh, released the front cover of their issue for this week and fight of the century is the tagline on the front cover so that speaks to how highly the, the kind of esteem this fight's been held in already. Well, the great fights need that jeopardy where you don't know what's going to happen or where you think you know what is happening and then it gets overturned by an incredible comeback. And that's, I think, why this is catapulted into the mainstream beyond the boxing fan. And people are going back and looking at it and going, oh, yeah, OK, she, she was beaten. That, that, like, she was over. This was, this was it. It was done. And that, that's the bit that I think sucks people in, right? Yeah, and like that uncertainty of outcome has been absent in Katie Taylor's career, essentially. Like there was a little bit, uh, naturally just the the gravity of the event for that London 2012 final. And it was obviously a very competitive bout in the end, but like there was a little bit of doubt around that. And then like in her entire professional career, like the comparable event was when she fought for the undisputed title against Delphine Pursun the first time. And she was a seven to one on favorite. So like that was, it was a huge occasion, but she was like walking in there expected to win, whereas she went in here as a, a betting underdog against like a serial world champion and an absolute superstar in Amanda Serrano, who, you know, is finally, fake it till you make it is too harsh in Amanda Serrano because she's a seven time world champion, but she always carried herself with this air of like confidence and had formerly been with Lou Bella, like latterly now with Jake Paul and, you know, she turned down the Katie Taylor fight a couple of times because she said she wasn't getting the money she deserved. And, you know, boxing it, at a professional level is a commercial business, so the likes of Eddie Aaron have to leverage it up. They can only pay what if they're going to make some, you know, incomings on their end. But she, like, kind of saw what was possible here and, like, doubled or tripled her money, money ultimately. So, like, you had that side of the dynamic where... Katie Taylor had this ideal dance partner from a commercial sense, but also in a boxing sense, because Amanda Serrano brought the very best out of Katie Taylor. And she really, she left it all in there as well. I think the round five, she saw this was her signature moment, her chance to to seize it and, you know, possibly 
gave Katie Taylor her best shot and, and Taylor withstood it and I think that was the psychological blow as much as anything which uh, steered it in Taylor's favour ultimately. Did, did Amanda Serrano get swept away and the importance of the event more than Katie Taylor I wonder? Like just in terms of like what she was saying right she was the one speaking right before the first bell went. Mm. Now in fairness everybody probably gets more swept away in the magnitude of the event in the moment than Katie Taylor given how composed she is but I, I wonder was that a factor? Yeah like we, we've spoken about Katie Taylor, the, the fanfare which tends to greet her events and the Natasha Jonas fight at London 2012 which broke the decibel record at, at those games and you know the final and, and all those events that I've mentioned you know she's used to it whereas Serrano has like fought in, in club shows she's defended her world title for fifteen hundred dollars you know this was an absolute sea change from her perspective and probably it's, it's important to note that the Puerto Rican like when when they were arriving the grand arrivals on the night and their their images were being displayed on the big screen there was a huge huge turnout from the Puerto Rican fr or fraternity so Serrano probably felt a sense of pride in that regard and def definitely tapped into it because I don't think she could perform any better. There, like if there is a rematch, there'd be little like tweaks, but I think she, she performed to her optimum level, but Taylor was just that little bit better in the end. So what do you do if you're managing Katie Taylor now? Do you get the rematch as fast as possible? We were having this debate yesterday in the show. Um, I mean, do you try and get a tomato can for Croke Park and cash in or what do you do? This is it. Like, it was. Um, it was quite striking that the press conference after the event was delayed as compared to most, because it was such a an attritional and damaging fight for both fighters. You know, and uh, like that has to be taken into play. It's not like in terms of a turnaround. Like, if they were thinking of going in August, for example, they'd need to be starting training camp almost next month. I just don't think that's feasible. So that's when, when the October date was mooted yesterday. I think that's a lot more realistic for a Crow Park rematch. Like, if you look at it from a Katie Taylor point of view, she could probably box me at Crow Park and, and sell it out. So she doesn't need this marquee matchup for that homecoming. It would just do amazing numbers regardless. From a Serrano point of view, like, she's still the featherweight champion. She obviously jumped up two weight classes to fight Taylor. And she wants to become the first undisputed featherweight champion from Puerto Rico, and she'll have to go back down to featherweight to do that. So, like, if I was from a Serrano point of view, I could see it's quite important for her to win her next fight, I think, to capitalize on this momentum. She doesn't want to be seen as a tandem with Katie Taylor. I think Serrano's built up enough credibility in the last couple of weeks where she could go and headline a show or just be chief support to that Jake Paul bill, which will obviously do massive numbers in August. So from both points of view I can see why they'd want to go separate paths and then possibly reunite in a year's time but similarly I think there's a sense you could probably just build on the momentum of what was one of the greatest fights of all time and you know some of the some of those marquee matchups have like sequels and, and trilogies and you know the Gaddy Ward comparisons where were quickly followed after the event given the, the, the pattern of the fight but similarly the, the kinship that those two built after that first fight and you know it was parlayed into the, the second and third I think that could very easily happen with these two so um, the fact that the money is where it's at as well I think it's a great thing that's now a base level for these two and there's no reason for them to dip below that so you'd like to think they're going to be the, the tide that raises all boats in the women's boxing game as well. How much did they make from the fight? So Taylor made around $2 million and Serrano was in the seven figures as well. So like uh, compared to the number I was mentioning earlier for Serrano, it's just, it's a whole different ball game. And th this is, that's totally betting on herself. Like she, um, uh, like many, many a person would have taken that fight in, in Eddie Hearn's back garden two years ago behind closed doors. And you know, you're relying on pay-per-view money. There's obviously no gate there. And Taylor was the A side in that fight, whereas she saw the value in it and you know, it's paid off in a big way. Yeah, fair play. You think that even without Amanda Serrano, Katie Taylor could come close to filling Pro Park? I d yeah, I was ta chatting to a few people about this. I don't think there's any question. I think she'd, uh, she'd probably sell out Crow Park back to back nights, Ed Sheeran style, if she if she wanted to, because like it's just such a marquee occasion and it's. It's a big number of tickets when you consider like they sold nineteen thousand at uh, Madison Square Garden. Nineteen thousand in Croker would be an amazing achievement, but it's not going to look full. I think she'd, she'd pack it out. Uh, like, you think 80, 90,000? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you think of, um, like, I covered some of the Anthony Joshua fights at, at Wembley Stadium, and, you know, it's not necessarily a boxing crowd at those events. And I would say a large proportion of those that attend fights at Madison Square Garden would be, you know, the boxing 
boxing at large and then a small amount of you know the, the Irish American contingent and, and so on whereas I think you just have a huge like pop culture tap in with the with a Katie Taylor fight here and it would just I think it'd be a natural fit um, and like there was so much talk ahead of this that were they being too ambitious taking Taylor Serrano to the big rim in Madison Square Garden it's the first female bout of any hue to, to headline an event there and they sold it out in the first go so I think they have to be similarly ambitious it, it poss possibly would be easier to just go to the three arena or to a, a smaller venue than Crow Park for for the Taylor homecoming but I think with the the power of Matrim and Eddie Hearn and some of the I don't think three arena is going to work anymore as well. When it was the point, it was differently configured. Mm. So um, I'm not sure. You I mean, the three sides or something, is it? Yeah, it's not quite the same. Well, it, it certainly wouldn't be the amazing in the round that you could have a, a croaker. Like there's probably there are probably other outdoor venues where you could you know build. Uh, so, yeah, maybe the Viva infrastructure for it and you know, parallel grounds. Exactly, but no, I just I just think it's an absolute shoe in that. Like the the reaction off the back of the fight at the weekend, it is phenomenal. So massive. It is a cultural phenomenon, and the the only other side to this is that Katie Taylor has climbed every single mountain there is, and she has her health, mm. and it's boxing, and every single concussive punch from this point forward is is damaging. So, is there a possibility she just walks away at this stage and says, "Okay, I've done it all." I think there's an argument to be made for that. I don't think she's the one making the argument. I think if, if you were suge to suggest that to her, she'd uh, be aggrieved by it. But I think there's a, there's a huge amount of logic to it because that was a hugely damaging fight. And I mean that in, in a practical sense where she's taking clean headshots in, in that fifth round. And, you know, Serrano's pro like, actually, without question, the biggest puncher she would have been in with, amateur or pro, I would say. so. You know, like if we, if we are talking about a sequel and a third fight with those, you know, it's going to be a similar pattern of fights. So, um, the the commercial benefits of of continuing are possibly too big, and the com the competitive spirit in her, like she's still she's shown that she's still the top dog and, and number one. So it's difficult to walk away in that regard. And any time the retirement issue has been broached, she's kind of fobbed it off and said I have a few, mo few more years in me yet so Tom Brady style I think it's a, it's a sort of kick the can down the road and, and hope she's going to be stopped asking that question. Okay so as a betting man would you say her next fight will be in Ireland? I think the practicalities of it are still it's so fresh from like a month removed from there's just never going to be another professional boxing event in Ireland was the sense to you know obviously what's happened in the interim and this like the fact that Eddie Hearn was volunteering that suggestion in the ring after the fight and it was all Jake Paul and Amanda Serrano herself were talking about let's go to Dublin, let's go to Dublin. Right. So like, I think that's a possibility. I think the more likely thing is if they could rematch at Madison Square Garden and then Katie Taylor, as we were suggesting, could have a homecoming against a different opponent in a year's time. Yeah, and that, it, uh, that might be more... You know, it's 50-50 it's, it's if she beats Serrano in Dublin. What a letdown. It's 80,000 people in Croke Park streaming out after a defeat. It was like, oh, man. That was, well, yeah. But the other, other side of that, though, is that it's, it's much higher than 50-50 in terms of packing it out and making this one of the, the best sporting events to ever happen on Irish soil if Serrano is the opponent. Yeah, it's true. That's true. Like, okay. any doubt around packing at Croke Park would be dispelled by... Serrano. Serrano, because there would be a travelling contingent from... Yeah, Everywhere. The American base. And yeah, I think there was a, a huge amount of people who um, would have wanted to be there on Saturday night and it's, it's going to be a lot more achievable if it's just up the road. All right. Good stuff, Ronan. Thanks very much for that. Cheers, lads. That's Ronan Mullen giving us his thoughts on a historic night for boxing in Madison Square Garden on Saturday, Sunday morning, our time. OTBAM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. John Duggan's up next. Here's Billy Walsh talking with Joe last night saying that uh, Katie Taylor's hands are the fastest he's ever seen.